Good morning. Uh, my name is Justin McDonald, and I'm a research technician and also a graduate student here at the Fisheries Ecology Lab at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. And today, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, what I do for my research, as well as also what my responsibilities in the lab are, and that is actually dealing with aging growth of fishes. So we're going to be talking about how we go about aging fish, uh, why it's important, and uh, just a little tips and tricks that I've kind of come across as I've been working with these. So this is probably the most uh, common question that I get asked when I work at rodeos or do outreach is, you know, how old is my fish? Kids will always bring in these fish and they'll be like, you know, oh, I'm so excited. How old is this fish? So uh, it's actually a very good question and a very important question to ask because knowing the age of fish is actually very important for determining the health of the population. So we have here two, you know, pretty common fish that we get uh, in offshore Alabama. Uh, the red snapper, which is probably by far um, the most important commercial fish and recreational fish that we have. And then also the greater amberjack, which is another very popular sport fish. And uh, both of these fish will be aged the same way, and it's actually uh, through a structure called an otolith. So otoliths are actually um, ear bones, and that's what a lot of people will actually call them, and they're interchangeable words and they are found within the inner ear cavity of fish. Uh, they're three different bones, just like what we have, and we pull uh, the largest one, which is called the sagittal otolith, and that allows us to age it. So when a fish is born, the otolith is actually just a core, and then as it grows, it will grow in concentric rings, much similar to like a tree, when you cut a tree and you can see it and age it. So same kind of concept applies with fish, and that's what we work with. Um, so the otoliths are actually uh, mostly uh, calcium carbonate, so about 90%. So you think about corals, seashells, uh, that kind of same material. Uh, but otoliths are actually in the form of aragonite. And then uh, another 10% is actually trace elements, and that's derived by uh, the, the surrounding water or the water chemistry. So otoliths can actually be a marker of different water bodies that the fish might be found in or they migrate from. Uh, if the if the patterns are different enough. So uh, that's a little bit of brief intro. Otoliths are actually uh, typically found in the same location in all fish, uh, just behind and below the brain, um, but they are very different in size and shape based on species. So um, with all that being said, we will just kind of jump in and I will show you how we pull them and, uh, and we'll actually let you see ones for each of these and go ahead and be thinking in your brain uh, what do you think the size difference might be with this big fish versus this little fish do you think they're going to be the same uh, the same shape same size uh, just start kind of thinking about that in your head and then we'll go into more detail about uh, why they might be different once we get them out so first thing i'm going to do is actually just take this tag off these fish were actually caught as part of our larger fisheries independent survey which is a monitoring program that we do for the state marine resources off of Alabama. So they're actually people from our lab fishing today. These were actually caught yesterday. So they're very fresh fish and they're actually going to be going towards our projects that we work on. So as you can see, as you get set up to do that, he wants to know how big is a fish brain? How big is a fish brain? Well, they're going to be uh, different based on the size of the fish, but not very large and actually that's a good question of something that I can show once we get in here because I'll have to go through the brain cavity to actually get to the otoliths but we're talking uh, maybe the size of a marble or so it's not very large and Rihanna asks why is the fish big is it because it's old but that's what we're trying to figure exactly. out exactly so growth is different for each type, type of fish and uh, it's just like with other organisms that you might come in contact with on land and whatnot, uh, different species just happen to grow different sizes, some bigger, some smaller. Um, but this actually will let us see how much the fish grows and at what rate. So we're really interested to see how fast fish grow because it's very different across species. So um, as we can see, we'll, most otoliths are typically found. So this is the operc operculum. And this is what is called the preopercle. Most otoliths will be found about where the preopercle is, and it will be underneath the brain. So to get to that point, 
I typically get the gill rakers out of the way and it is going to be kind of bloody. And I will basically be able to fill a capsule and that is that internal capsule that we were talking about earlier. So that is where the otolith will be sitting and it's a fluid filled capsule so that it can actually free float. So not only do otoliths aid with hearing, but they also aid with orientation so that the fish can tell exactly how it's sitting in the water column. So I just have to get this back out of the way a little bit. We, don't, we wanna make sure that we don't break it because it'll be very important to have it whole as far as the aging process goes. And while you do that, Penny asks, do fish have eardrums like we do? So otolith, O-T-O-L-I-T-H, is the ear bone, but is that the same thing as an eardrum? Uh, this is not. So the ear bones, so they have otoliths, which are the ear stones, and then they have semicircular canals, which we also have, but I do not believe that they have ear drums per se. So the way that sound travels underwater is very different than the way it travels on land. It's still a wave, but the way that the fish interprets sound is actually because they have these otoliths, this is the densest thing that's in their body. So it will actually pick up the waves as it travels through the fish. So it's not so much the way that people work, it's more like a vibration through fluid is what we talk about. And see, so this would be the otolith of a red snapper. So fairly large. And actually, we'll get it cleaned up and then I've got a ruler over here so we can have an idea about size. So how big can they, are most red snappers the same size with their otoliths? Um, no, their otoliths actually grow uh, with their body. So they start off fairly small and then they'll actually get quite large until they hit, without getting into too much detail, what we call asymptotic length. So that's where they really kind of stop worrying about somatic growth or getting bigger, and they switch to reproductive growth. At that point, their growth rate really slows down. So then the rings that we're talking about on the fish, they really start packing in tight. So you see a lot of growth initially as the fish grows, and then as the, as the growth slows down, then the stone will slow with it. So uh, they will be small with small fish. Super big fish uh, will probably have pretty similar sized stones. So as Justin digs into our amberjack to get um, his ear bone, kind of give a poll in. Do you think this, the ear bone of the amberjack is going to be bigger or smaller than what he pulled out of the red uh, snapper. Y'all just can throw it in the comments and then we'll, uh, we'll discuss it afterwards. Um, so is the otolith found in the same place on all of the fish? Essentially, yes. Um, the process of which you pull otoliths can be different and you'll see here I'm gonna use a different process than what I used with the snapper just depending on uh, the shape and the size and all of that. But they will typically always be where the preopercle is is a really good indicator of where it's gonna be located. So this would be the preopercle here. So I'm going to assume that it's probably about here and it's going to be just behind and below the brain. Okay, and the preopercle that you're talking about, um, is that basically kind of where its gills are? Well, the gills are actually under the operculum itself. So all of this is the operculum, operculum and then this would be the preopercle here. Right, you can't really see it great, but it's in there tight. Gotcha. Y'all keep weighing in. So, for a fish like this, I'm actually going to use a saw, and I'm going to go through the head as opposed to going underneath the gill. So again, this part will probably be a little bloody, but not too bad. How come this fish is bigger? Yes. Uh, just because it's a, it's a different species, so this fish uh, just gets it gets larger than the red snapper does. And then, Marla and and also take into a oh sorry, also take into account that we don't know what ages these fish are. So really, that could be a young 
snapper, which is why it's small. This could be an old amberjack. You know, we don't really know, and that's the whole. You know, that's that's a, a you know the whole purpose of pulling these structures so that we can actually get ages to see um, what size they might be at each age. Just like uh, with people, you know, you have an idea of how tall uh, you should be when you're growing, when you're young, based on your age. We do the same thing with fish. Marlon asks, what is the hardest fish to pull an otolith from? Uh, a lot of people would probably say this one right here. <laughs> um, amberjacks, tunas, a lot of those have pretty difficult otoliths to pull. And we'll get into that discussion after we after I pull this. I don't want to give anything away, you know. Yeah, this is normally uh, the kids' fa the kids' favorite part at Discovery Day when they come is actually when I get to uh, pull the head off. <laughs> off. Um, so this is actually the brain canal. So as we were talking about earlier, the brain size. This all here would be the brain canal. So as we're saying, it's not super big, and it's going to vary from fish to fish. But I have to get all that brain out of the way. Why you do that, Leela, who's 11, she wants to know, do sharks have otoliths because they are fish? So, sharks are actually not teleosts. They are not bony fish. They fall into something called elasmobranchs or cartilaginous fishes. So, they actually do not have otoliths. So, can sharks hear? Or? So, they have a totally different sensory system as fish. They rely really more on... Um, chemical receptors. So they have things uh, where they have pores on their noses and things called ampullae of Lorenzini, which actually pick up sound waves that way through chemical receptors rather than from sound waves from structures like otoliths. So it's a different kind of physiology uh, based off of different body structure and types. So. Right, so we are in the brain canal to get the otolith out of the amberjack. And we have several people who have weighed in to say that it will be bigger. And then Hannah believes it might be older with a smaller open. Ah, very bold prediction. Uh, Hannah also says, my hypothesis is that it will be smaller because of how big it is. Somebody's listened to an otolith talk before. So this is the otolith of an amberjack. Well, can, can there we go. It's so little. It is itty bitty. And I'll clean it off and put it by the ruler so we can see uh, just how different it is from the red snapper. So the amberjack otolith was smaller than the snapper's otolith. And we're going to see how small, how much smaller it is. Let me try to clean it just a little bit. Yeah, good job, Hannah. Try to turn it around. Hannah wants to know, how do they even hear without an eardrum? So it's a different... So basically it's relying on vibrations of sound waves. So the otolith itself will pick up the vibration and it'll send it through the semicircular canal. Um, Kyla, she's 11. Why are fish so different? <laughs> Um, I mean, just like with everything else, uh, different fish are, you know, they inhabit, inhabit different environments. They have different functions. So you have fish that, you know, eat more, um, you know, like plankton or, you know, plants or whatever. And they basically set the base of the food chain without getting into too much detail. Uh, they're very important uh, primary consumers, which are then basically going to be food for the upper level fish that eat, you know, smaller fish and then bigger fish, you'll eat that fish and then the bigger fish will eat all the way up to like sharks and other apex predators. So uh, if all fish were the same, then they wouldn't be able to um, have a functioning ecosystem like what we have. So that would be why they're all different. Um, Ethan wants to know, what is the spring thingy inside the fish head? So. The spring I'm, thingy. I'm wondering if he's talking about the gills. This here? Oh, this. <laughs> is this what he's talking about? Ethan, is this what you're talking about right here? 
What is that? Oh, these are the gills. So these are gill rakers. And what do the gill rakers do for them? So that's what actually, so as water flows through these, it can actually, that's what's pulling the oxygen from the water so that it can oxygenate its blood. So that's how fish can survive underwater. And they do look like springs, Ethan. You're right. <laughs> um, Charlotte, who's eight, why are fish different colors? Um, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> I'm really keeping me on my game this morning. Um, I would assume, again, really more based on, you know, where they live and what they, you know, and the habitat that they're in. Different colors would be more suitable for different fish. So uh, let's say, like, some of the counter colors that you might see um, is actually a way that fish will camouflage themselves where if they're dark on the top, when something looks down on it, it's gonna blend in with the sea floor. And when it's light on the bottom, something looking up, it might blend in with the surface. So it's really just gonna depend on, uh, you know, again, where they're living and the habitat that they're in. Uh, light is very different with the way that it goes through water and its absorption so red is typically like one of the first colors to go so being red like this they're really not going to look you know this color at depth because that water is going to basically absorb that light so Kyla wants to know what is your favorite fish my favorite fish uh probably that one right there but that's also because i'm biased that's my uh, study fish that has become part of my life here recently <laughs> so uh, but they're very fun to fight, and uh, they actually taste pretty good. A lot of people enjoy eating them, so that's probably, you know, probably would be my favorite one. Charlotte, who's 10, she wants to know, how smart are fish? Uh, well, some fish are probably smarter than others, but it's hard to judge, like, knowledge based off of fish. Um, some fish do seem to... Uh, have behaviors that would have them maybe show a little more risk. So maybe they're easier to be, maybe they're easier to catch than others. But uh, generally, I'm not really sure how smart they are. <laughs> That's that, that might be actually a good Aquarius question. Yeah, that might be for somebody else. Behaviors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Jason wants to know what are some of the longest living fish according to the Ovalus ah. that you've seen in your research. So that's very good. Um, actually, you're looking at a very long-lived fish here. This one is not so old, but snapper uh, actually do get very old they can get to about 55 so that's a very large that's a very long-lived fish red drummer another one that can get very old probably around about 45 um, very slow growing very long living fish so a fish that's um, you know a fish like this would take a lot longer to get to a large size than a fish like this who's only going to live about 15 years and that's it they've got a very short lifespan fast-growing, uh, short lifespan. And we can move into inside where you have some stuff to answer Sophie's question. She's asking how old this fish is, but you can show them, but pulling the otolus is only the first part. Yeah, of so that's only that's are. only the first step of what we do. So uh, there's a lot more that goes into it, and we can, we, yeah, we can get into that inside. Yeah. So we're going to walk in. Um, Hannah said, wanted to let you know, y'all rock. And are very <laughs> brave doing this, so we, thank you, Hannah. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ethan, who's 10, he says, is there a fish that you don't like? So we know what you do like. Um, I don't know. I don't think I've ever met a fish I don't like. So <laughs> not too biased. I like most fish. Um, so what we have here, are, as you would see, this is like a bunch of otoliths that I've already pulled. So we have slides for all of them. And that way we, we know the specific... Uh, fish ID, which corresponds to the length and the weight that we've already collected on all of these fish, because that's important to have uh, for later on um, to go along with the ages so we can do different models and things. But after we take this, then I would actually cut them by hand on this saw. And basically I would go until I can get to the core. So you know, remember we're talking about that core that all fish are born with. That's what we want to see because if we don't have the core, then we might miss rings. So we wanna make sure we get to the core, where it all starts, and then work our way out. So when I cut them, I would actually have something like this. So that might look, that might look familiar, right? It's just half an otolith. So I wanna make sure that I cut half of it off and basically look for the core, 
and then I'll glue it on here. And then after that, I would cut the other end off and then I have a slide that's ready to be aged. Um, Jane is four. Do clownfish have otoliths? Do clownfish? I'm sure they do. They would be a teleos, a bony fish. I've never seen one, um, but I'm sure that they probably do have very, probably, you know, small otoliths. It is a small fish. Um, that isn't always the case, as we've seen, but they are a reef-associated fish that are pretty uh, benthic. They like to be on the bottom, so uh, they would probably have, you know, pretty small otoliths for their, for their size. Um, Hannah asked me what my favorite fish is. Um, I don't really know. I've never thought about it. Um, <laughs> I will say that talking with Justin and all of the researchers here, I like to hear all the interesting things that y'all do with them. So, uh, <laughs> I like any fish, <laughs> but I will say the octopus is my favorite to watch in the estuary. Oh yeah, those are always fun to watch. So this would be a picture of a finished product. So I used the, I actually used my scope here and it has a camera on it. And that allowed me to put a slide under here and take a picture. And then this is actually what I'm looking at. This is a red snapper otolith uh, from a project that we had probably last year or 2017 at the latest. Um, Aria, she's seven, wants to know, what made you want to learn about fish? Um, probably that I just really enjoyed fishing when I was younger. I'd always go fishing with my granddad and I really enjoyed being outside and fishing. And once I figured out that I could do that for a career, I was pretty much sold from that point forward. And that's actually a red drum otolith. So as you can see very different shape and size. So this is red drum mm -hmm. and this is red snapper. Yep. And this is the cross section of it. Yep, so this is the cross section. So as we would look at aging, this is the core that we were talking about right in the center. And then we would work our way out. And basically this translucent area, that's gonna indicate periods of fast growth. And then this opaque area is gonna indicate periods of slow growth. And two of those bands, or each one of those paired together would represent one year of growth. So fish being, uh, having to deal with their thermoregulation, being the fact that uh, their growth is very dependent on water temperature, you would see growth change throughout the year, uh, faster during the warmer months and slower during the colder months. So this would be a year of growth, a year of growth, a year, a year, a year, and a year. Oh, oh they all got a shot of me. <laughs> Sorry guys. Um, do dolphins have otoliths? Uh, they should. They're mammals, so I would imagine so. Um, I have. I, I will tell you now. I do zero dolphin and manatee work. Uh, that would be. Dr. Carmichael. Yeah, that would totally be all, Dr. Carmichael. <laughs> uh, I am a fish guy. Love my fish. Aubrey, who's eleven, she wants to know. Do you know how many fish that you've dissected? She probably doesn't want to know. <laughs> lots of fish. Um, lots of fish. So, uh, for these projects, we need to know a good representation of the ages that are in the population so that means we do have to sample lots of fish so that we can see what the size structure is so how many of each age class are present because you want to see a good spread of ages if you only see lots of young fish then that could be indicative of some problems maybe like overfishing or Maybe they had a bad year class and something happened to those fish and you want to try to figure out why. You want to see a good spread of fish young to old. So it takes a lot of fish for us to make sure that we're seeing that kind of representation in the population. Um, 11 year old wants to know, does, do you know this? Does the taste of the meat change due to the age? So as a fish gets older, <laughs> does it? So I mean, I, I would say yeah. I mean, I don't know that there's like, you know, scientific proof behind that or whatever, but younger fish tend to taste a little better, kind of just like how younger deer, I guess, people like to say that younger deer taste better than older deer. The meat gets tougher for whatever reason. Um, for certain fish, older fish do tend to have more parasites, so that's something that the amberjack do get. As they get older, they get wormy. <laughs> they get lots of worms in the meat, and uh, so... A lot of times people don't want to eat the really big ones that they catch. Uh, they'll really just do it for sport, just for the fun of it. Um, Diane asks, what causes variation in growth rates besides the water temperature? So what else can affect these as we look at 
let's look over at the red drum, the difference in those, the slow growth and the fast growth. So that's a really good question. Um, there are some other things that could influence growth, uh, things like resources, uh, making sure they have enough food, maybe competition with other fish. Those can all play a role in how fast a fish grows. Um, but you will also see, uh, this is a pretty natural transition that you will see in all fish where there's a lot of fast growth going on here and then it's slowing down. That's it getting to that asymptotic length like we were talking about. So that's when it's really switching from trying to get big to focusing on it, focusing its energy towards reproduction. So as you can see with snapper, it's really starting to, this one's a little young, but if we were to have more out here, they're starting to get closer here, they would continue to get closer together. And that's just a natural transition you see in, a, in fish. Um, Tanya asks, what school did you go to? Because I want to be a marine biologist. <laughs> I actually went to Troy, uh, Troy University in Troy, Alabama, and now I'm actually at, I'm at South uh, doing my master's. Uh, Charlotte, who's eight, what fish are most common in our area? Um, well, two of those out there are pretty common. Um, red snapper, of course, is probably you know the fish for the state of Alabama uh, as far as offshore. Um, inshore, you see lots of red drum and speckled trout, sheep's head. Uh, you also see a lot of uh, like vermilion snapper and trigger fish, things like that, your common reef species. So we're, we're very diverse here. We have lots of fish and we have a lot of structure um, offshore in the uh, artificial reef permit zone that provides a lot of habitat for those fish to live in. So it's a good resource for them. Um, Tammy, she's an educator and she says, how much garbage do you find in or on the fish? In or on the fish, not much. Um, we're not looking for microplastics if that's something that she's thinking of. Uh, we don't do a lot of gut contents anymore, but typically we're not finding too much trash like inside a fish. And I guess speaking to that, the research that's done in the lab, in any of our labs, depends on um, what's being funded to be researched at that point in time. So mm -hmm. it's not that you won't ever do gut contents again, it's just at this point in time, it's not. Yeah, right now we're just not. You know, We used to do a lot of it in this lab, and uh, right now we've just kind of switched to more kind of uh, monitoring work for the offshore fish, trying to look to make sure that the populations are, you know, staying healthy and helping uh, the state to make management decisions with our data. And then also, um, you know, just inshore work. We have some, we have a grad student working on oysters and sheep's head and things like that, so. And we're, last question is gonna come from Ava, who's 12. Um, she says, how can you tell how old, how old a fish is if they don't have an otolith? Well, they should have otoliths, but um, there are like non-lethal ways of aging fish up to a certain size, and that's actually through spines. Spines grow in a very similar way as otoliths. They kind of make layers on top of each other as the fish gets bigger and the spine gets longer. They'll actually make layers, and you can section those spines and you can, you can age them that way, but that only works for so long because once the fish gets really old, they really pack down so tight on top of each other, it just looks like one big ring, essentially. Um, but I don't think I've ever found a fish without an otolith, so. <laughs> well, Justin, thank you so much. And Rihanna, she, she wants to know who I am. So, hey guys, I'm Angela. I'm the one behind the camera that's been asking the questions. Uh, we appreciate everybody who's been joining in. Um, we ask if you have any ideas for future segments, let us know. Um, and we will have our schedule out for next week um, later on this afternoon. So I'm going to flip it back over to Justin. And Justin, thank you so much. Yep, thank you. I hope you all learned a lot.